Welcome to The Art of Conscious Living. Today I have a very incredible, beautiful, special guest, Lydia Kinehart. She is a woman who I have known for the last 15 years. She has a restaurant called the Sunflower Cafe in Petaluma, California. And she's all about organic food, vegan, and she has a also cooked food. But it's done in a very, very special way. She really understands the alchemy of food. And I'm really, really very pleased to have her in the studio today to speak to her about her life and so much more. Lydia, thank you and welcome to the show. Thank you. How are you today? I'm good. I'm glad to be here. Well, let's start at the very beginning. You were born in Paris, France. Mm -hmm. And as a young girl, you had a great interest in food. And you were also looking at what it be like to be in the state of being hungry. And this kind of implored you to start to investigate. And your journey began. Well, I was uh, raised with uh, my mother and my father, who was an educator for United, uh, United Nations, UNESCO. And his main field was Africa. And so I was raised with a lot of social workers. And uh, so I was surrounded by a lot of different cultures and a lot of stories. And it would just get me to think about other people's lives. And uh, through pieces here and there, I started picking up information and it started questioning things. And uh, I experimented by fasting. I wanted to feel what hunger was like. And what was it like? Um, I, I got to experience what um, the need for food as opposed to like having food that's so available for us at any time and uh, I was young I was 13 years old so I didn't go too far with it to really you know go as deep maybe as I, I could have to really what what is it like to be starving or anything like that but just to stop the process of always eating and feeling what it's like to be without food and just recognizing and having compassion and a relationship with the state of other people in the world. So it gave you a great respect and great reverence for food itself. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't think of it that way then, but that, that's true. That's true. And when did you start to think about organic food and raw food opposed to conventional food and processed food? Well, I moved to the States when I was 15, and there was just so much information. And I have a very curious mind, so I started reading a lot and and just asking questions and people in California, you know, about vegetarian and organic foods and it all made sense to me. It was very logical. Why eat things with pesticides when we have a, cho a choice not to eat? And not everybody has that choice, unfortunately, but if, if we can. And so it got me thinking and I did a lot of uh, reading and experimenting on myself and I would go and fast a lot. And that was more for awareness and cleansing and seeing the relationship with food and actually how different um, how our being opens up when we don't eat in a different way like a spiritual journey if you wish. So do you think there is a great correlation between eating processed food and eating the natural wholesome food where you can the natural wholesome raw food gives you all the nutrients and the vitality where the processed food is giving you minimal nutritional. Absolutely and it, it's it's really effect, affecting the state of mind of most people. It, it's like if you're eating things that's been so processed, so full of chemicals, and, or you eat, eat something from the farmer's market that somebody grew with care and love for the land and with the elements of the sun and the water and all these things that we sometimes take for granted that are so valuable, without it we could not live, as opposed to something made in a factory with just, just so many things that don't belong in our bodies and most people don't even know the processes that food are going through these days and when you take that in I feel that everything that we take in everything that we live everything that we experience has an effect on us and if we're always fed foods that don't have nutrition don't have vitality have a lot of toxins we're going to become that it's going to be hard for us to think feel and be happy beings happy healthy beings what just the stories have you seen where you have your restaurant and thousands of people come to your place over the years and they came in and they may not have been living that lifestyle and they found your place and then they adopt your food and make it their lifestyle at this point in time. Mm -hmm. what, did you see great differences in people, in different men and different women? 
I've seen a lot of people, like for example, right now we're having, we do a juice cleanse at the Sunflower Center once a month where we offer juices where people can pick up. Makes it really easy for them, okay, this is all I'm, I'm taking, or they eat a salad or something if they want to incorporate that as a meal. We have a support system for them also that they can call in and we have a group that meets prior, the week prior. So the changes that I've seen in people and just change their whole life and their eating habits and I just had this lady in this morning I was talking to, uh, they've changed their lifestyle and her husband was on uh, uh, diabetic and close to getting insulin shots and, uh, and then um, uh, had a lot of excess weight and a lot of, uh, was on a lot of meds and he got off all of that and he's, he's so much better, they both feel great and there's tons of stories like that. So yes, I, I, I see it and it's so rewarding and it keeps me going to do more, wanting to do more, to make that food more available to people. And how long that particular story of that gentleman, how long did it take where he started starting on the juices and the raw food? Where, where did he start to see the goodness and the benefits from it? I don't know that, per, that particular story. I don't know when they started or which, which but I, I see people like in just one juice cleanse and then eating prior, like in a month, if you wish, really incorporate a lot of things and having major changes in their lives. I love it about you that you are very much about community and mm -hmm. educational. It's just not, you have an incredible passion and, and I feel it's very dear to your heart mm -hmm. that you really care for people and you really, really want to help and you really want to be there with this information and this very powerful service that you're doing to help others? Well, you know, I, I look at the state of the world, you know, and it's what's going on. People are so sick, you know, when Neil was talking earlier. I mean, why are people getting so much cancer? What is the root cause? A lot of it has to do with food and also we're surrounded by and, uh, different chemicals and EMFs and all sorts of things. We're bombarded stuff uh, with things all the time that our bodies are not meant to process. And so how how can I do my part? This is a gift that I have, I feel, that with food and bringing people together. The Sunflower Center is an 8,000 square foot space. It's about 3,000 square foot in a retail space, but it's not retail, it's a whole experience. We have great audio, visual, we have a great kids area where people can just come. A lot of people call it an oasis, a sanctuary, where people can just come and drop in. They don't have to, you know, you're at home, oh, I gotta wash those dishes, oh, I gotta fix that thing, or. But there people can just let go and they're taken care of or they read a book or just whatever. And to create an environment like that means a lot for me because I know there's times in my life I wish I would have had a sanctuary to go to, you know, to just be, feel comfortable and feel nurtured and cared for. And I know that that's everybody's wish. And we live that way, you know, in our lives and in history. We lived in villages and tribes. We lived in community. We ate together. We didn't eat out of boxes, you know, driving in a car. We ate together, and that was a time where we shared what we had, and, and uh, that's a beautiful thing. And that's a, a, in many places in this culture, it's lost in a lot of families and such, and you know, and and uh, so it, I feel it's important to recreate and bring our our connection and our relationship with food, you know, and bring this to community to share together. Absolutely, yeah. You have a lot of events at your center too. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Recent events, past events, John Trudeau mm -hmm. and Mad Dog, yeah. uh, his uh, incredible prolific words, a bespoken word. Yeah. He was there uh, a number of weeks ago. Currently, which events are happening? Uh, we've got different uh, reggae bands and um, uh, drummers and uh, we've got Jay Utal coming July 28th and uh, Nubia, his wife, who's an incredible Odissi dancer. Um, te that's temple dancing. And we have workshops and classes. We have a permaculture course happening there. Uh, there's a lot of things going on and too many to name and they're constantly, we're booking more and more. We've been at that location just a little over a year and uh, it's just really building. And so people are recognizing it a place that they really love and want to participate in it in one way or another. So performers and teachers love to be there and be part of it. When you're not there at the center, what are you doing in your private life? You seem to be a person that's very introspective and very quiet and very to yourself and you have a great reverence for nature. 
Mm -hmm. I do, yeah. It's, it's my, my solace, if you wish. You know, I, I work a lot. I'm usually there, like, most all the time, except when I don't sleep. But when I can get away, uh, I like to be in nature. I like to escape to, like, in Mendocino County or, you know, be around trees and water. And, and uh, that, that's what I enjoy gardening. I, I'll go up there and I'll take care of plants and prune trees and things like that. When I can work on the land, it just really feeds me, and I, I, it just, it's a relationship, you know. I'm taking care of the plant. I can, uh, when you take off dead leaves or uh, leaves that are sickened or s something, you know, you, you remove that, you're taking care of the plant, and it's bringing life, it's appreciated, and it gives, gives back, you know. I think that everything feels, everything carries energy. Everything has, maybe not a heart, but everything has a vibration. And, you know, vibration from my heart to something is going to carry over and it's going to bounce off and create that and bounce off and have an effect. Well, Nikola Tesla was saying yeah. that we are vibrational frequency and energy. Absolutely. And to respect that. Yeah. And people might say, oh, no, it's not energy, but, it, you know, simple thing from the old type of radios when we would walk by and it would go, all, go all scratchy and grrr. you know it's like it shows we're we are electrical beings there's no way that anybody could say that we're not it's measured it's scientific and and so everything has an effect you know and everything is vibration our thoughts you know mm -hmm. our feeling how our heart rate's going uh, just what we think and feel is very important well it's an incredible place in Italy called Demaher mm -hmm. and they're doing exactly that they're scientifically proving the relationship of the plants, and the plants even are emitting uh, music from them. Yes, certain mm -hmm. plants. Yeah. So yeah. they are doing all of this and so much more mm -hmm. at Demaher, of course. Yeah, uh, it was a great book, *The Secret Life of Plants*. I can't remember when it was published a long time ago, but they're proving all these tests uh, on plants and how they really feel, and from in another room, and you know, or if something happen to another plant and uh, you know people think we're we're separate from life we we're it's like I don't know what people are thinking that we're just like here living our own world within the earth when there's all these being there's all these plants there's all these creatures and water and all these things that we are very connected we are water we are minerals in our bones we are the rivers that run through our veins you know, we are the the sun, you know, which warms our body. We are all those things. So it's it's important to reconnect. And, and I think that's that's the big thing to, to change in this uh, society these days is that we need to feel reconnected. And how do we do that? I feel is to, instead of me, myself, and I, I'm going to do this for myself, how do we move in our life of like, the we, the common, you know, how, do, how does my life, my choices, what I do affect everybody else? And not just everybody, all the creatures, all the plants, and all life forms. And if we live our life with that thought, it's going to lead us in a good way. Right. So in essence, it's how to have the respect for our own thinking and our own process and to take accountability and responsibility yeah. for our thoughts, that we are not isolated onto ourselves, mm -hmm. even though we think we are not we are right absolutely and, and in doing so when we feel that connection to others there's infinite possibilities there yeah yeah and you know united we stand i mean that's you know there's an african proverb and it's like if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far you know go together you know and it's so true we need each other and we're not we're not put on the planet to be here by ourselves in a little cubicle in a little house by ourselves and it, we're 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 uh we're people of people <laughs> you know we're we want to share and uh, uh i think some some people forget that because they're so isolated and you know it's it's a time when then there are more people on the planet than any other time and there's some uh, where there's the loneliest time for a lot of people you know do you think the making of you was really back in your childhood back in paris france growing up in France opposed to growing up in America? Well, my parents were very unique and they were beatniks. They lived in New York. They were exposed to a lot and then they, they were very educated. So I was raised with ambassadors, social workers, jazz musicians, artists, all of it. So I think it had a huge impact on me on the, the scope of things and really opened my mind to a lot of things. 
and we traveled a lot, and I think it had a, a large impact for sure of uh, acceptance of people and it's not one culture is the best way or how are pieces, you know, people doing different things in different ways and it's okay because it's their way and maybe we can learn from each other, you know. Uh, I don't know why this concept of one race is better than the other or one border, you know, who, who made the borders? It's like, you know, how mm -hmm. can that be like our way is better than yours because we're from this country? I don't understand that. So. Well, in the finest sense, the great science, uh, science of yogis, they say that there is no borders, mm -hmm. there is no lines, yeah. there is no boundaries within oneself. When you let that go, you are truly enlightened. Mm -hmm. You're truly awake. For those who have these borders and these, these, these lines where somebody says to you, well, I draw the line there, what are they really saying? What are they really doing? They're, they're, at that moment, they're causing a separation between themselves and to the other person. Yeah. So when, there is, when, they, when they allow the lines to be absolutely not there, they're coming from their honest and open and from their heart. Yeah. and from simple grace, grace of being. And that's, that's where life sits. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely, without borders. And we all have lines that were put upon us, you know, growing up or in a society or parents trying to protect us. You know, a lot of lines are created from fear, you know, and it, as opposed to if we're really open and in trust and in our hearts, then those borders, you know, um, go away. But, uh, and some people, it's easier for others, you know, some people have really hard lives and it's, it's hard not to fear, it's hard, you know, for getting bombed, people, all sorts of things, you know, it's how do you let go and trust, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's a tough one, you know, mm. to really accept where we are today and just stay in our hearts, that's the biggest thing, is to stay in our hearts. Do you have plans to expand from California? Uh, to be perhaps in the East Coast or anywhere else? But yeah, I feel, I feel that it's, it's, it's time, it's past time, but I think the time is really open right now for people want to eat more healthy, but it's not available, you know, enough. Like people are running around and how can I get healthy food fast and available and that uh, tastes good? <laughs> and I feel that I have that. And uh, I, my plan is to open more places if, you know, if I can, I will, and I'll go as far as I can. I'd love to open places all over the world. I don't know if it'll be possible in my lifetime, but I'll go as far as I can in, in a healthy way, you know. And uh, um, I feel like a fast food place where people can drive up even, you know, or people can walk in or more centers, little places according to different places. My dream is that I could have a place in Harlem and have food available and affordable that they could buy it and it was healthy and organic. Now, if I can achieve that, then it would be like a dream come true, you know. I mean, that's one of the dreams, but. So how many stores are you in in Whole Foods? Um, I don't know how many stores. It's, I don't know. Is probably it just West Coast or are you? No, we're nationwide. Okay. With Lydia's Organics, my p packaged products, which is bars, crackers, cereals, and kale chips and other types of chips. Alkalining and, soup. Uh, that's more local because that's a refrigerated line. That's available at only about 25 stores locally due to its shelf life. But the other products are, you can, we can ship and we ship to Canada also. But um, I don't know, it's, I haven't looked in a while, but around maybe 500 or more stores at this point. So would you like to have a franchise or? Yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure if it would be like a franchise or investors coming in and, you know, opening other places. Um, I have to look in the format and uh, in a deeper way because I know franchises have different uh, legal structures to see what would work best, you know, and. Uh, I'm not exactly attached to the format. I just want it to work in the best way, you know. And I'm not doing this to be rich or anything. I just want to serve people as much healthy p food as possible, you know. It's, it's, I feel like it's, uh, it's a crime that people are fed so many chemicals, you know, and that babies are born with so many chemicals in their bodies. It's like, how, can, how do they have a chance to be healthy, you know? To reverse that takes a lot of work. You can get heavy metals out of your system. You can take radiation out of your system. You need knowledge with that, and not everybody 
has that knowledge or, you know, have access to the food. I mean, there's some places in neighborhoods that fresh food's not even available, you know. So community gardens, all those things. There's a lot of great organizations doing wonderful things to bring that to neighborhoods. Well, there seems to be a thinking that uh, organic food is too expensive. And the people, the general population, they think that they're going to eat uh, processed food and they're going to get their nutrition from there. But my thinking is that, you know, there's no nutritional value there. And why would you want to do that? And the owner of Whole Foods, um, John Mackey, he is basically saying that you can get good food, organic food, and raw food, but you just need to know how to choose it. Mm -hmm. You just can't go and be a kid in a candy store and say you want all of it and think that it's going to be cheap. But you could still have some of it oh, and start there. Well, the thing is preparing our own food. If, we, if we're talking about prepackaged food, Yes, it's very expensive to buy organic foods. But if you buy a bunch of kale for, I don't know, $1.50 or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and some sesame seeds that you soak, and, and then, you know, maybe some mung beans that you sprout, that's extremely nutritious. You've got protein, calcium, chlorophyll, you, you know. And, I mean, uh, just a little handful of mung beans that are soaked and sprouting and kale, that makes a meal for two people, you know. Um, so it's not going to cost that much. I mean, I could probably make a you know, with a little sauce for, you know, f I don't know, retail four dollars. I don't buy retail <laughs> very often, but right. four dollars for two people for a meal. So it's learning how to prepare our foods is really key, and what's available. Our sunflower seeds, you know, are cheap, are very nutritious. There's a lot of greens you can grow. You know, lettuce. You can grow a kale plant, which will turn into a, a bush and keep harvesting it. I keep saying kale because it's the most nutritional plant there is, as far as they have found. And, but that can grow in a pot, you know, it can grow in a, in, indoors if you need it. And you can just, it'll, I've had kale plants last for six months when you just keep harvesting and f feed you. So it doesn't have to cost that much. I think it's, a, it's knowing how, or, or mm -hmm. going back that we don't need the meat and we don't need, you know, these certain things that have been, I feel so brainwashed that we need all those things. We actually need very little. And we don't yeah. need the processed dressings yeah. that have been marketed to us that are costing a lot. So we could just use simple olive oil and lemon. Yeah, well, olive oil is expensive. You can make a sauce out of seeds. You can just grind it up and make a sauce. I used to live in the desert, and I ground all my seeds in a hand grinder and made it like that and mixed it with some herbs and such, and it was a great sauce. It was some of the most delicious food I made, and it was very simple. And what seeds would that be? I use uh, sunflower seeds are one of my favorite. Mm. Yeah, because they're so nutritious, and I love sunflowers. <laughs> but they're so nutritious, and it you know like ecologically to grow, you know, it doesn't take a lot to grow sunflowers, and they have a lot of food. I also love almonds, but they're a little more expensive. So if we talk making food available, that's for people who are very, very low income. But it's possible, I feel, to for anybody to have have good food. Well, give me an overview of what a kitchen should look like uh, from making food from scratch instead of the processed food of opening up the bags and the cans and all the marketing of such products. What would one need in that kitchen? Uh, it depends on your budget. Okay, So a, a blender, you know, is really, is really handy. Uh, a Vitamix is the top of the line. It's an expensive machine, but you can grind up pretty much anything. A uh, food processor is great. If uh, you, you know, somebody live, is watching this and lives without electricity, which probably not, but you can use a hand grinder, like a, a meat grinder, you know, the old-fashioned ones, and you can buy them in thrift shops or find them somewhere, flea market for like five bucks. Um, you know, a good knife, chopping board, some jars, or I, you know, because I do larger quantities, you can use little buckets and a, a screen, and you can soak your seeds and grow them in the jars or buckets. And uh, they don't need water. I mean, they don't need uh, soil. Certain, a lot of seeds don't. And um, others you can grow in the dirt. But if you have that, I mean, you don't even need a refrigerator, you know. Uh, you can sprout your seeds and uh, have some greens that you eat daily. And if you plant, I, 
you know, I tell people to plant your food. When you harvest your own food and you, you watch those little plants grow and that seed that you put in and grow into a plant and it feeds you, you build that, new, uh, that relationship. And you don't have to wipe the whole plant out. A lettuce plant will give you so many leaves if you don't cut the whole thing off. You just take the outer leaves and the little ones will grow into bigger ones. I was just telling that to my daughter yesterday. She was texting me. So should I cut off the whole lettuce or should I, how do, should I do this? I told her that she was excited about it. She planted a big garden. So what is the importance of sprouting the seeds? You can sprout lentils and all the other uh, legumes. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the importance of sprouting them opposed to not sprouting them and eating them and boiling mm -hmm. them and eating them as, as soups when you just mm -hmm. cook all the nutrients away, basically? Right. So a seed is dormant, and it, imagine it is, a seed it is, has a lot of energy. I mean, it's been carrying for centuries, millennia, who knows how long, its, its DNA, its history and such. So it's very concentrated. So when, when, we, when we soak it in, in water, it starts the whole life process. So it's, imagine like a bear in its cave, you know, and then it comes out and it, uh, it starts feeding itself and getting plump, you know. So the seed gets plump full of water and it starts growing. It increases in nutrition. It also increases in enzymes. Enzymes is the life force. Cooked foods don't have enzymes. That's a problem with, uh, with cooked foods. So when you eat cooked foods, you know, I always encourage people to eat some raw foods with it. So some people like to take enzyme tabs, capsules, or you can just eat like a salad or even some celery sticks or incorporate it in it. So, um, and also uh, there's enzyme inhibitors that prevent the seed to grow. So when you uh, soak it in water, it actually releases in the water. And those uh, enzyme inhibitors are toxic to us. So it releases in the water and you wash it off. So it doesn't have the toxin, it has more nutrition, it has more life force. We want life force. When we eat those sprouts, they just make us feel more alive. When we eat you know, live foods, it just makes you feel more alive. So those are the qualities of sprouts. And it's easy to grow, it's simple. You can have a sprout kitchen you know, uh, very easily with just a little counter and some jars draining. The key to sprouts is draining them properly. So you soak them overnight and you want to drain them. You rinse them and then you drain them. If you don't drain them properly or if it doesn't have good airflow, if it's blocked, you know, if you have it sealed, uh, then they'll rot. That's the only trick. So how often are you draining and how long is the process? Mm -hmm. we, uh, we wash them uh, in the morning and in the evening. And you can have mung beans sprouted in like three days, you know, and they're ready to go, even two days. So at different stages. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like to make a, a mix with clover, radish, and um, clover, radish, mung beans, and uh, there's one more, broccoli sp uh, sprouts. And uh, it, it's a great mix. Mm -hmm. I love your pâtés. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, you're, you make the... Uh, Pâtés from the sprouted seeds. Yeah, so uh, seeds have f uh, fat in them, and they're also easier to digest. That's another thing when you sprout seeds. Mm -hmm. So um, they have a higher water content, and some of the fat got converted into the growing uh, phase. So, um, and, and then I grind them up in a food processor, and I add vegetables. I don't like making a pâté just of seeds and nuts because it's kind of heavy. Although we make a cashew cheese, so it's like a, a cheesy kind of thing. but um, Adding vegetables, your favorite vegetables, but I love carrots because it's a little sweet and celery is really good for you. It has a lot of fiber. And then you can add parsley, basil, different things. Make, you know, a Taiwan, an Italian, whatever flavor that you like, and just add different herbs. It's really uh, great. Yeah. Well, Lydia, share with me and others what is a typical day, what you would be eating? Um, first thing in the morning to the last thing at night. The first things that... I I, I drink water. I, mean, I like to kind of neutralize my body. And then I j usually do more liquids like a smoothies or a green juice or something like that. And then I'll eat um, a salad. And uh, my favorite is the purple goddess salad, which I think is your favorite too. It has uh, a lot of vegetables and kalamata olives and apple cider vinegar. And it has kale and parsley so people get their chlorophyll too. You can't tell though. Yeah. And um, then kale salad. And how, and how did you do that? Do that's what? what I really love about you, is the alchemy of food. Uh -huh. You really respect that and really know that. How did you get those other ingredients in the purple goddess salad? 
Well, I just try to incorporate chlorophyll in everything. You know, some things like chocolate or some, th some things, you know, it's just kind of mm -hmm. not possible. So wherever I can, I do it. And, it. and, you know, if you cut it fine, I used to trick my daughter all the time, um, cut it fine like she didn't like parsley, but she had it in food all the time. Uh, then you cut it fine, people don't know. So, you know, sometimes people, oh, I don't like this or that. But if you cut it fine and mixes with the other flavors and blends, it, it works. Um, I go a lot by intuition. I've been doing this for so long now, but I just understanding what each food does. That's the thing. You know, is that going to be juicy? Is that going to be dry? Is that add a sweetness or bitterness? Does that add uh, more water content? So it's learning what each food does and then how, what do you want to bring in? What is, what, what's your end result that you're looking for, you know? Or just you're creating along and, and, and throwing those things in and looking for that balance that's going to work. What's the last time that you've eaten red meat or have you ever eaten red meat? Mm -hmm. It's been a long time now. Um, it's been, uh, well, I was 16 years old and I'll be 50 this year. So, so 34 years. 34 years. Mm -hmm. So for those who are the naysayers and the deltas who say that you need meat to survive, mm -hmm. you have survived for 35 years without meat. Yeah, and there's plenty of other people. There's Olympic athletes. I mean, at this point, there's a lot of, there's bodybuilders, you know, there's, so there's a lot of, of people that show that, that, um, that use their body strenuously. I mean, the thing is, uh, meat is a byproduct of the greens that they were eating in the first place. So it's like they got their nutrition and grew a, a large body or, you know, or chicken seeds or whatever, you know, they eat a lot of insects too. But um, so if you look at a cow, it's eating the greens and then we're, we're getting that vicariously. So as opposed to just going to a source, it's going to be a lot easier to process in our body. It takes a long time to digest meat in your system. And, uh, and then, you know, there's all the how are animals treated and the fear that they go through. I mean, they, they have feelings or their, their uh, babies taken away for veal or so that they keep uh, making milk. You know, it's like that's not that's not natural for a cow to always be giving milk. You know, it's just it's not a natural process. And I feel it's a, a form of enslavement and it's a form of uh, torture and a lack of respect for another living being. Well, 50 years ago, they started industrial farming. So that's where it all started. Yeah. So all the animals are, they don't see the day of light. And they're all in miles and miles of tin sheds with in cages with light bulbs and treated uh, extremely horrific uh, yeah. circumstances. Mm -hmm. And now they're shooting them up with a lot of hormones and additives and fatteners and to, so they could process them faster. Yeah. Yeah, and if we, you know, if you look at an environment, you know it, that it's very sickly, and they have to give them a lot of antibiotics and all that. So if I want to eat a healthy plant, you know, and if if I was a meat eater, I would want an animal that lived well or something. But everything that we're eating, we're eating all of it. We're not just eating this piece of meat. We're eating a piece of that being that had that this experience and this life and everything that happened to it the hormones, the horror that they're experiencing and pecking at each other because no room and loss of limbs and ulcers and all this, and this is a fact, then when we're eating that, we're taking that in. Again, it gets back to what we were saying earlier, the energy and the vibration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, We're taking that in and ingesting that in our body. So we're taking in all of their energy yeah. of what they had experienced. And it's a very violent environment. We're taking in violence when we eat that way, you know, and then we see so much violence on television and movies and I mean I feel it shouldn't even be allowed for, so people there's so much horror that's being you know constantly pumped into uh, people and so that violence we're taking in audio visually loud you know loud music that's very harsh on the system and all these things and then we're supposed to be healthy beings there's no way and you look at the, the results, you know, cancer was a rare thing in children years ago. And now it's a common thing, you know, in diabetics and all obesity these yeah. today. Obesity is a huge problem, mm -hmm. you know. People are not well. If people don't feel good. People aren't happy. You know, how can you be happy when, with all these things going on? And, uh, but I feel that, you know, that can be changed. 
And uh, it's really about making a decision in ourselves to change that and, and seek information. Right? You know, we live in an environment where there's so much information available. Google has done a great job in making everything available, typing something in. And, you know, not everybody has access to computers, but yes. information is available. There was an amazing documentary from a gentleman from Australia called Joe Cross, fat, sick, yeah. and nearly dead. Yes. And he was nearly dead. He was uh, 300 pounds plus. He had an incredible uh, uh, skin uh, rash. And uh, he came to America and he traveled from New York City to California and on it with a juicer. Yeah. And he went on a juice fast for many months and documented all of that. Mm -hmm. His losing the weight and how he was feeling and how he came more alive. and. Yeah. And today he's inspiring so many, mm -hmm. thousands yeah. of people he's inspiring and helping them. Yeah. Where they're on death's door and they have many uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, drugs that they're on, yeah. and they're off of those yeah. by embracing the juicing and back to the organic food and back to basics, quite simply. Yeah. The way that the Amish actually live, don't they, on the yeah, East Coast? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how they live and what how they live, uh, but uh, live. But they they make all their own food, and mm -hmm. when you make your own food, you know where it's coming from, you know, or your neighbor, or somebody you care care about. It's a whole other th thing, and I, I'm sure that their rates of health and disease are totally different than the mass culture yes. in the states. Well, we cannot have a conversation about food without talking about GMO, genetically modified organism. Yeah. And what are your thoughts on this? I mean, it's it's a, a horrific concept that people are allowed to, uh, big companies are allowed to take something, you know, a fish DNA and mix it with a tomato or whatever and then release it. When you're mixing DNA like that, a fish is a fish, a plant is a plant. You're mixing things that should not be. You shouldn't, you're messing with things that should not be. And, you know, and, and these, uh, they, yeah, they want to release trees that uh, release pesticides, insecticides and such, you know. It's like this is pure insanity that this is even happening. Um, but money has a lot of power. And the thing is, is that we can take that power back through the money that we spend. Where do we spend our money and what companies we support? You know, because that if they, they, there's not a market for it, um, they're they won't have a company, so they're gonna maybe grow kale in a healthy way. But uh, it's, I think it's, we don't know the effects of GMO because it's, you know, I don't know how long they've been doing it and how many people have been eating it, but it's hard to detect because it's an accumulative thing. Maybe another generation's gonna feel the effect of it. But when you mess with DNA and you're taking that in, it's like, I don't know what, you know, weird mutations are gonna happen or, or what. and. How are we going to track that down to say, oh, it was you, you know, who did it, you know? And uh, well, for sorry. those who don't know what a GMO is, a genetically modified organism, and the seed itself, let's let's explore that. Where the seed, a, a natural seed, is, you can take it again, and take it from the ground after it sprouts, and then you can plant it again. The GMO seed, you cannot do that. Yeah, it's inherently built into it where it's dead at the end of the first it's cycle, yeah, cycle it gr it the first grows, harvest. Yeah. And also, all of the uh, pesticides, the fungicides, the herbicides, and much, much more of toxics are built into the seed. Exactly. Yeah, and, and where s seeds, like if an insect eats it, uh, or a plant, he's probably, they're gonna die or something like that. Well, I mean, if, if that has an effect on some insects, it's gonna have an effect on us. There's no way that it can't. The, a poison is a poison, you know. Um, but, like, I only buy watermelons with seeds in them, you know. And it's like everything is supposed to have a seed to continue its life. It's like, um, you know, its longevity. That's how it's been. And to, for a company to make seeds that don't reproduce is, uh, is a crime. And, um, it's also those seeds are being handed to culture where they don't know where GMO, they don't have a concept of that a seed could not reproduce. And all of a sudden, then they don't have a harvest and they're dependent on the company, Monsanto, to buy their seeds from, which you, then you need chemicals and other things to use their stuff. 
and then you become slaves to that organization and they've lost their ancient seeds because now it's gone and it's happening worldwide and tons of Indian farmers in India have committed suicide because of of this problem of uh, they're stuck in a vicious cycle and they can't afford the chemicals and all this and they don't know their way out it's a very it's a very sad thing it's very unnatural and um, I think we really need to watch where our food comes from and and the thing is is that there's no GMO labeling how do we know it's labeled or not so we have to do our own research and uh, there's whole organizations that we can tap into and what companies you use GMOs for packaged foods we know what uh, certain produce is grown with or without it. But a good rule of thumb is that if you eat organic, Next, yeah. you know that there's no GMO in Correct. there. Yeah, absolutely. But the problem is, is that there can be an organic field and a GMO field, and the wind is carrying that mm. over and is going to contaminate that field. And so, and wind blows, you know, things carry over. And how much is that being spread? You know, we don't, we don't know. And what's flowing over is the fungicides and herbicides that they're using on the crops. Right. Yeah. Mm. So it's a major problem. And Monsanto has bought up 90% of the seed companies in the entire world. Yeah, you control the food and the water. You have people eating out of the, your hand. There's a lot of countries, though, that don't allow Monsanto, that don't allow mm -hmm. GMO. You know, there's, I think it was Hungary that burnt all their fields down. People are realizing the strongest uh, uh, hand hold that they have is in the United States, you know. Yes, because it's an American company, yeah. and the government has had endorsed them 100 percent and yeah. behind them and supports them. Oh yeah, I, I heard. I haven't seen it for myself, but I heard that the, a bill just got slipped through that um, there is no. For Monsanto, there's no regulations for water, the, uh, the earth, or there's no regulations for them. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. really? Yes. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know how this can happen. Well, from where you sit right now and looking at the world, from being a young girl at 13 years old with all the wonderment, and you were in Paris, France at that time, how has the world changed? And it's changed directly. Drastically, it's changed now. We have a lot of concerns going on in the world where mm -hmm. we have radiation, and now they're changing the quota for radiation that could be in drinking water because as the radiation has seeped into the water and the oceans, now they're upping it more. Uh, mm -hmm. That's their way of handling it. The bees are dying in mm -hmm. the, uh, over the planet. Uh, they're controlling it with uh, chemtrails now, of trying to control the weather, uh, which is aluminum, a barium, and a number of other chemicals, some mm -hmm. plumes that come from the back of the planes. Yep. And then that reflects the sun back instead of reflecting on Earth, and all those chemicals come down. So the oceans are contaminated, the lands are contaminated, uh, everywhere you look, and then we have technology in there and we don't even know where and what effects that's having on human because we just started to explore that big time right. in the last 10, 15, 20 years. So where do we look at the answers in all of this? And where is the first question even in any of this? It seems to be it's completely out of control. It's, it, it, it's the greed factor is at an all time mm -hmm. rampant high. Yeah. And it's just, of self-destruction going on. Absolutely, I, it's it's hard for me to understand how people don't don't see that, or they have children, you know, that are having those major effects, or the government, or Monsanto, and all that. And, and I don't know, they have plans to go on another planet or create bubble cities, which I've heard that there's some underground cities and things like that. But is that really a way to live? And um, you know, we are in trouble for sure. We are in trouble. Um, and it's not a pretty sight, and there's a lot of work to do. And the thing is, everybody has a gift, everybody has a passion, and to find our own passion and gifts that we can contribute to make a difference. And to look at all the choices that we make and to refine our own selves, to be better human beings, to be more compassionate and kind, kinder and more loving and have a positive in, uh, impact on our own lives and every, everybody and everything that we do. 
And if we live our life that way, I think it will lead us out, you know, and, and just to, to care about everything around us. I think that's, for me, that's my focus because I can, I can get pretty overwhelmed. I'm pretty sensitive and I have a lot of information. I know a lot about what's going on, so I'm sure you do too. It's easy to get overwhelmed, you know, but I think it's to really stay, what can I do right now to have a positive effect? What is the best choice I can make right now to ha have a positive effect? How can I take better care of myself and everything around me? How can I use less water? How can I grow my food? How can I, you know, affect this person's life? How can I live simpler? How can I drive less? How can I, you know, support a good cause? All those things have a positive effect. There's tons of organizations worldwide doing little pieces and parts, you know, and uh, a lot of nonprofits, a, a lot of great people doing things. So th there's a lot of activity going on, and we might not see it all. There's a lot of positive things going on of people who care and having a huge impact. So I think that, you know, sometimes people get discouraged. How can I do something by myself, you know, or, or I, I'm just me. But then you look like a simple man like Gandhi, you know. I mean, how much effect did he have? Or Mother Teresa, Paranza Yogananda. There's, I mean, endless people like that that have had a huge impact on many, many, many people's lives. Martin and on Luther a, on a, King. Yeah, Martin Luther King. Yes. You know, yeah. uh, on people's lives and the, the world itself. So we can make a difference. It's to recognize we can make a difference, and we do make a difference every day, every moment, you know, by what we do whether it's one way or another or in the middle, but we do, we make a difference. So how can we make a better choice to make more of a difference, to lead us? And essentially, the platform of all of this is building community and yeah. sharing community yeah. and knowing that we're not all isolated and yeah. we're, we're not all by ourselves. Right. And whatever you can do to start those micro communities, mm -hmm. it's Absolutely. very important to acknowledge that and to to celebrate that, yeah. because there is our answers there, and, and in, in the awakening of that, and living that, yeah. where if you don't do that, the opposite of that would be that you are just going to be controlled and told what to do and how to do it, and greed can completely be there and yeah. only there. A lot of times, though, is people are so busy. I say, especially in this area, Marin, Sonoma County, you know, Bay Area, people are so busy, and it's very expensive to live here. People are so, you know, focused on making money to stay up and, you know, maybe live beyond their means and all these things. And so, and then there's no time. There's no time to share. They're, you're so tired. You just want to plop under the TV or such. So, the thing is to how can we live simpler? with less because all those things pull on us some way, you know, even if it's a thing, it has to be dusted or it has to be repaired or it has to be clean, it has to be this or that. So all mm. those things take our energy away. So how much do we need? Can we live in a simpler matter? It's going to free our time up, you know, and uh, maybe not buy as much so we can, don't have to make quite as much money or then we can take some more time off or, or something. and play more with our kids or maybe go see the neighbor and introduce yourself to your neighbor, you know, and you might need that neighbor one day, you know, and uh, so I think you're right, building community is critical. Absolutely. So how do we use less to get more? Yeah, I And how do we re respect that yeah. and really work with that? One of my favorite sayings is less is more because, you know, when I eat less instead of more, I feel better because my body is going to work harder to digest that food. And so I don't always live it, you know. Uh, if I have less things, I don't have to take care of it. If I have less respons, well, I have a lot of responsibilities. We won't go there. But so, but living simply, um, it's just a change of conditioning, you know. It, the whole dream has been the bigger this, the two cars, the more this, the that, you know. Does that really make us happy? You look at people like Michael Jackson and a lot of people that were really wealthy, um, they died very alone and, and, and depressed, you know. It's, that is not the answer. The answer is heart connection. It's, it's what is making, feeding us to make us alive, you know, and, and being in nature, taking care of a plant. You know, I keep coming back to that, but we're so disassociated in our lives from 
the earth itself. When's the last time some people have actually put their feet on the earth? You know, it's, uh, and there's something about that connection of the earth itself, you know, and it's uh, going back to simple living. If you study tribes and such, a lot of these people have lots of time, they, they respect nature, they respect a lot of the simpler things, they have a connection with their river because that's their water, they have connection with that tree because that's giving them food. They have an understanding of that relationship where that relationship has been broken where some kids don't even know where an apple comes from. You know, it's like because it's in a plastic bag at a store, that's where apples come from. So it's rebuilding that connection and when we rebuild that connection, it's going to lead us uh, uh, the way. I think it's going to lead the way. Well, Lydia, what final thoughts do you have? It's been an absolute incredible pleasure to speak with you, an honor to know oh, you, you throughout these years. And thank you. Thank you for taking out the time of your very, sure. very busy schedule of being here and speaking with me and sharing all of your beautiful grace. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. What final thoughts do you have? I really want to encourage people to, to make food with each other, to make a meal and share that. It's an offering. You know, if I make some food and bring it to you, it's an offering. And all the food that I make, I feel is an offering to people because I put so much care and love into it. And so I encourage people to make food for themselves and share it with others and sit down at meals and actually sit down uh, with somebody and share it. And I, I, that's what I'd like to leave that. And I also like to really thank all the people that have supported me through my life and my mother and my daughter really supported my life. and into what I've accomplished so far. I have fed a lot, a lot of people and affected a lot of people's lives. So I'm yes. grateful for that. And, and I've shared that food with people and encouraged people to share their food with people. And I love the label of your food, Lydia Loving Foods. Mm -hmm. Absolutely perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And from the art of conscious living, do take care of yourselves and take care of others.